using Different cultures, with few exceptions, quickly learn how to brew beers and ferment wine in the distant past. And some societies cultivate important knowledge that you today would recognize as science. Possibly before, and certainly soon after, humans learned how to domesticate the important crops that we rely on throughout the world. People learned the importance of fermentation, getting the buzz from alcohol, and the critical role of beverages as a social lubricant. Some archaeologists have even argued that people originally dropped honey and gathering life ways uh, to go into the drudgery of farming and also village life, private village life, uh, because of their interest in beers and wine, which you needed to settle down, to have fields, and things like this to produce. Um, Patrick McGovern is an archaeologist, but a particular kind of archaeologist practicing what he calls molecular archaeology. Most, if not all, archaeologists have fun with what they're doing. Uh, Patrick's work, though, has taken him into the exciting realm of beers and wines across continents and across time, some from distant cultures existing many thousand years in the past. Patrick has also found that that black organic crud dried on the bottom of pot shirts and pottery vessels actually holds the key to some of the uh, incredible beers and wines of the past. By analyzing old vessels and pot shirts in the vast collections of the Penn Museum here and throughout the world, Patrick has done a form of reverse engineering. Um, he's been able to figure out and recover and resurrect the old ingredients from old recipes for brewing. Most importantly for our gathering tonight, Patrick has also collaborated with local craft brewers to recreate some of these beers in a form of experimental or applied archaeology. The results of these efforts have been spectacular and exquisite in the eyes of beer drinkers like myself. Patrick's new book, Uncorking the Past, is bound to change beer history and encourage beer makers and beer drinkers to explore more widely and appreciate the incredible diversity of beer culture throughout time and space. Patrick clearly shows how archaeology and the past can still be relevant. So to beer and wine lovers, past and present, I present Patrick McGovern. Thank you very much, Clark. Uh, I'd just like to say cheers to everybody. Uh, we've got some lightest touch here, which uh, I think has uh, suitably uh, eased everybody's uh, minds somewhat. Uh, this is part of the subject tonight. and. Uh, uh, We'll lead now into the more intellectual side of it, which uh, will be uh, uh, a little chemical and archaeological background. Now, this this topic is very dear to my my heart, my research, and my palate. Ancient ales, wines, and uh, some of these very unusual beverages that you're going to hear about, like Midas Touch, uh, which we call extreme uh, fermented beverages. And I, what I propose to do is to take you on a little trip back in time, uh, to as far back really uh, to the origins of, uh, of fermented beverage making, uh, maybe 100,000 years ago even, uh, when our, our species uh, came out of Africa. And uh, we'll trace this around the world. And, and then what I'll try to do uh, is you know, show you how we've actually recreated some of these beverages, uh, especially with the help of Dogfish Head Brewery uh, down in Delaware, and uh, we were very fortunate to have uh, the president and founder, Sam Calgioni, with us tonight. So after I give, you know, sort of a, a background on some of these beverages, he'll also be commenting on the taste profile, the processes that might be involved in uh, making some of these beverages. And so I'll be touching on uh, Archaeological discoveries, of course, I mean, because I am an archaeologist, but then I'll move on into uh, some of the chemical side of things, uh, how we do these analyses. But for the chemically challenged among you, you don't have to worry. I'm not going to get into you know, huge depth as far as uh, explaining all the techniques. And uh, then we you know, also you know, look at you know, some of the ancient texts and uh, artwork. It, it turns out, like, especially for winemaking, I mean, we have ma magnificent frescoes of the whole winemaking process uh, from Egypt uh, that give us a lot of information about how these beverages could have been made. 
Uh, and you also have to refer to modern ethnography because as you'll see, uh, people around the world are still making these beverages today, so we can actually learn a great deal uh, by looking at them. But perhaps most importantly is this experimental archaeology side of things, which has led uh, to the recreation of these beverages and really bringing back to life things that were lost. So it really sort of takes you on a trip, you know, back in time as you drink uh, some of these beverages. Now I'll start right out with Midas Touch uh, because that is the first beverage that we recreated. And this is the tumulus, uh, called the Midas Tumulus, at the site of Gordian uh, in central Turkey. And this is actually an artificial mound made up of layers of stone and soil that uh, is the most prominent feature at this site. It was excavated by the Penn Museum back in 1957 and buried down at the bottom of this, uh, this tumulus is a hermetically sealed log chamber that held the body of what we presume to be the king. Now there isn't a sign that says, you know, here lies Midas. Uh, but the date uh, is approximately right, 740 to 700 BC, and uh, it could be his father, Gordius, that was buried there. You know, we're not really sure. But it is a very spectacular tomb, and it led to our recreation of the funerary feast, because before they buried the king, they had a special feast, and we were able to uh, do the analysis of both the food and the beverage uh, remains, and the food uh, turned out to be a spicy barbecued lamb and lentil stew. And, and then the beverage, which we call Midas Touch, and this is the recreation that uh, Sam was involved with, uh, was used to, to wash down this delicious, uh, you know, high protein uh, meal. And we actually had a recreation of that uh, funerary feast right here in this room. I don't know if any of you were present, but uh, it was back in the year 2000. And uh, were, were there anybody? Uh, well, of course, Sam was here, uh, Tina, and some others. Okay. Uh, but it was really a spectacular uh, example of how you could bring a, a feast uh, like this back to life. Now, when the Penn uh, archaeologists cut through the logs into the tomb, they were met with a sight that was very similar to what Howard Carter saw when he. Uh, came upon the tomb of Tutankhamun. And uh, there was a, uh, an individual, uh, turned out to be a male, um, who was about 60 to 65 years old. And he's lying on a very thick mat of textiles uh, and felt. The textiles were actually dyed blue and purple. And these are the royal colors. But when they opened up this tomb for the first time to light and air, you could actually see those colors start to fade away. Uh, the most important aspect, though, of this tomb, from my point of view, was that it has the largest Iron Age drinking set ever found. <laughs> this is 157 uh, bronze vessels. It includes uh, very large cauldrons for holding the, the beverage, uh, drinking bowls, uh, jugs to take out the beverage, and in fact, if you uh, come back to the museum uh, in the future, for the next several months, we have an exhibit on the first floor that shows a reconstruction of this uh, large cauldron. And this is about 150 liters, uh, and there were three of these large cauldrons. So you know, we're talking about fairly a uh, large amount that was served at the, uh, the funerary feast. Uh, now you might say, if this is Midas's tomb, where's the gold? because all these vessels are made out of bronze. Uh, but if you take some of these magnificent uh, buckets or citrullae that are lion-headed, ram-headed, uh, and you clean off all that green corrosion, you actually get down to something that looks like the precious metal. So maybe some wandering Greek you know, came through, you know, saw these you know, very uh, beautiful, uh, golden-looking vessels, and you know, went back with the tail. There was this guy named Midas, you know, they had the golden touch uh, over there in Turkey, and that's how the legend developed. Uh, but what I was really most interested in was what was inside these vessels. And this is the residue that was in many of the vessels, uh, very intense yellow, almost like gold. And this was like the easiest excavation I ever had to do. Uh, it turned out that 
these residues had been collected by the Penn excavators back in 1957, and they had been brought back to this museum, and they had sat in their original paper bags two flights above my laboratory. So all I had to basically do was walk up two flights of stairs, collect these bags, and then our analysis uh, began. And uh, basically what we're doing here is we're, we're taking those residues, extracting them with different organic solvents, and then looking for fingerprint or marker compounds that tell us what the original natural products would have been, what the original ingredients in the beverage were. And uh, for grape wine, it's tartaric acid, uh, which is found in large amounts only in grapes uh, in the Middle East. And grapes also have yeast on the surface of some of them, so once you extract that juice, it will start to naturally ferment into grape wine. And then uh, we've picked up uh, very distinctive compounds of beeswax, and if you have a honey product, you never can get rid of all the beeswax. There's always going to be some amount of it. So if you detect that beeswax, you really can say that you have a honey product. And again, honey also has yeast already in it. If you dilute that honey down, it will start to ferment into uh, mead. And then finally, something called beer stone or calcium oxalate, which points to the presence of barley. Well, now this seemed like a pretty strange concoction. I mean, uh, back in the 2000, I hadn't heard about medieval braggots and uh, you know some of these mixed beverages from the Middle Ages. Um, and, and to me, this was like uh, an extremely uh, unusual beverage to mix wine, beer, and meat together. You know, you almost could sort of cringe at the thought of drinking such a thing. Uh, <laughs> some some uh, cartoonists got carry, carried away when they, uh, they, they envisioned this whole process, too. And you can see this, this poor fellow down here, he's, uh, he's had a little bit too much of the, the Midas touch to drink. Uh, yeah, it really can you know, pack quite a lot. Uh, so this got me to thinking, uh, well, you know, maybe it would be interesting to do some experimental archaeology. Why not see, uh, you know, if we, if we come up with a drinkable beverage, you know, we're, we're going to call this Midas Touch, of course, uh, and uh, just to speed things up, uh, there was a, an annual beer drinking event we had here at the Penn Museum with Michael Jackson. Now, this is not the entertainer, but the, <laughs> but the uh, the scotch and uh, uh, beer uh, maven, who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, but he uh, had a special uh, dinner that was held in his honor, roasting and toasting him. And so I got up at that dinner and I just uh, explained this, this very strange beverage to everybody and said, well, maybe some of you microbrewers out there you know, would like to try to come up with this. Uh, and. Uh, you could meet in my laboratory the next morning, and we, I just could give you some more of the details. Well, about 15 microbrewers showed up, and we, very soon I had all these strange concoctions arriving at my doorstep, because you know, we had to come up with something drinkable, and my job, you know, which is a really tough job, was to <laughs> taste them and see if, uh, if any of them met the, uh, met the standard that we were after. Uh, well, obviously, uh, Sam Calgione won that, uh, that competition, and the result was uh, Midas Touch. And here we see the uh, golden thumbprint of the king himself. And uh, this is the most decorated, I guess, of Dogfish Head brews. It's won uh, three gold tasting awards, very appropriately. I think five silvers, and won another bronze this year at the Great American Beer Festival, which was uh, just two weeks ago out in uh, Denver, which uh, I was fortunate enough to go to and, and help serve some of these uh, delicious uh, beers. Uh, before I turn the floor over to Sam, I'll just say that uh, he had used saffron, which you see right here, uh, as that uh, bitter agent. You couldn't use hops. Hops only start like you know 700 AD in Europe. But it turns out saffron really has some very special uh, characteristics. And even though it is the most expensive spice in the world, uh, Turkey is the, uh, the place where some of the best saffron is produced. And so uh, I'll let uh, Sam you know, make some comments now about uh, anyway, the processing. <laughs> 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 I don't think I 
need this if I can talk into this. Oops, is that fine, right? Okay, so I don't need this. Um, so to talk specifically, before I talk specifically about Midas, uh, um, very briefly about our company, if some people uh, might not be familiar with us, a one minute overview of Dogfish. We opened in 95 as the smallest commercial brewery in America. Uh, in that era, there were about seven or 800 uh, breweries in America, but our focus from day one was off-centered ales for off-centered people, uh, the BU. Uh, and um, uh, in that era, there weren't as many off-centered people, and so our, our goal was to try and brew the antithesis of what uh, dominated the uh, commercial brewing landscape then and now. Uh, literally 99% of the beer that is brewed commercially around the world today is some slight variation of the exact same style, which is the light lager, which is not, you know, a very refreshing light beverage, but it's brewed to appeal to as many people as possible and not offend anyone. So in, in essence, it's a very commodified and light flavored uh, beverage. And that was not what we were going for when we started our company. Um, so when we were back in 95, we opened up a tiny brewery in Rehoboth, Delaware, and brewing beers with chicory, licorice root, St. John's wort, coffee, uh, grapes, honey, raisins. You know, we were looked upon as uh, heretics or freaks or weirdos, uh, even by the, the uh, some folks within our craft brewing uh, community in that era. Um, and so this opportunity to, to work with uh, Dr. Pat was wonderful because all, all of those light loggers, in essence, whether it was conscious or not, were referencing the same quote unquote tradition, which is uh, the Rhein Heights Gebot. And you beer folks in the room know that that's the uh, uh, Beer Purity Act from Bavaria of, of uh, 1516, uh, where in essence the Bavarian government mandated <coughs> that beer could only be made with uh, water. Uh, Hops or water hops and, and barley, and, and it was pre Louis Pasteur, so uh, yeast wasn't included in that equation, but it was uh, implied. Um, and, and now, all those 99% of the commercial beers made in America somewhat reference the Rhine Heights Club. Bud Miller and Coors have bastardized that a little bit to include rice and corn, uh, but that's a whole different talk. Um, and so we were looked upon as untraditional brewers for making beers that didn't reference the Rhine Heights Gebot. And our, our brewery's opinion is that the Rhine Heights Gebot's a relatively modern form of uh, art censorship. Uh, and these opportunities that Dr. Uh, Pat brought to us, we'd done a number on our, on our, on our Tracy allowed oh, oh, sports <laughs> events. Uh, um, that might be Coors, Butter, Miller <laughs> jumping in uh, to make sure that this message doesn't get out there. Uh, let's go. Phillies? Is it Phillies? Let's go, Phillies. Talk to me. I don't know, what do you got? We don't know that happened. Alright. I'll just talk around it. Did they win? What's the score? It's very awesome. The room is great acoustics. You want me to just talk anyways? Is that good? Okay. Check, check. Are we good? All right. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to do this as quickly as I, I can. Uh, but, and I promise the next time I'll only get up and talk about the beverages. But I did want to give you guys some context, which is, you know, these beverages were really like a, a portal for us. Uh, we did some, some on our own before we got to meet Dr. Pat and Pat, him trying one of our medieval uh, braggots is kind of what got our first conversation going. So we've done that, we've done a Tej, which is an African honey uh, beer brewed with geisha root for bitterness uh, and some other stuff. But when we met, it really sort of solidified my belief that our path to convince people to embrace beers beyond the Rhine Heights Cabot was more backwards looking than forwards looking. <coughs> Uh, meaning long before the Rhine Heights Gebot existed, beers uh, around the world uh, were way more uh, colorful in that they uh, embraced the local indigenous ingredients of whatever culture they were made within, and there was just this breadth of color and diversity. Uh, so the first that we uh, got to do together uh, was the Midas Touch. Uh, I remember Dr. Pat, a very scientific man, came down 
first he said, do you guys have a lab that we can do, you know, do some tests in? I was like, yeah, yeah, we have a lab. And our lab was uh, my black lab named Phoebe. Uh, but I wasn't lying. I said, we have a lab, and we did have a lab. And uh, we did one test batch, little test batch, before we did that dinner that Dr. Pat referenced uh, up here. And, uh, and it turned out extraordinarily well. As you can imagine, brewing a beer with white muscat grapes from California, saffron, from uh, Turkey, white uh, thyme honey from Italy, extremely expensive beer to make. So we were anxious and didn't think we'd ever make it other than that, this dinner that we did uh, here. But it really captivated uh, people's imaginations. Uh, People Magazine did something on it. Um, uh, Today Show did something on it. And it, it, it was uh, incredible for, for giving momentum and validity to the idea that you don't have to reference beers that exist uh, that are referencing the, the, the Rhein Heitzkabel to be brewing traditional beers. Uh, so uh, Midas uh, is an, a beautiful hybrid between the worlds of mead, honey, and uh, mead, wine, and beer. And uh, it is, as Dr. Pat uh, mentioned, our most award-winning uh, beer that Dogfish Head uh, makes. And uh, it's a great beer with a uh, spicy food. We, we purposely uh, reference food when we make our beers. They tend to be more wine-like in alcohol and therefore more compatible with uh, food. Uh, so this is a beer that works really well with spicy food on the modern palate, which again tells us we haven't learned much because uh, his research on the uh, on the food side of this, uh, they were they were eating a, a spicy lamb stew and they made it, which is exactly what it would go really well with today. So that's my touch. That was a great that Today Show, you know, and uh, Matt Lauer and there was this uh, blonde Olympic swimmer that were both tasting the Midas Touch at you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, and, uh, and the swimmer uh, said something like, well, you know, this is really good, and, you know, Matt Lauer agrees, and she says, it's so aromatic, and, uh, and, and then she says, it, it, you know, it's something that... Uh, uh, that women would probably you know, enjoy, or, or you know, women in general like a lot. And he sort of saw a double take by Matt Lauer saying, "You mean I like a chick beer?" <laughs> <coughs> but uh, it got the word out, and the word is, is continuing to go out. Now, uh, I want to take us back a little bit before 700 BC when Midas uh, was, uh, you know, back, uh, you know, perhaps uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, when, you know, I think it's possible that, uh, that humans, you know, could have very easily started making fermented beverages early on in, in our existence. And uh, we may not have all the chemical evidence for this yet, but as you'll see when I talk about the Chinese evidence, you know, we keep pushing the, uh, the edge, you know, further and further into the past. So you, you can sort of imagine uh, our, uh, our ancestors uh, taking whatever sort of fermentable resource they have in their environment. You know, it could be fruits, it could be stalks or roots that they chew on, it could be honey. You know, these are sort of the prime, you know, sugar resources that they could have used. And they would be basically foraging through their whole environment trying to find whatever they could. I mean, you have to imagine you're in an era before modern medicine and you are really on the lookout for anything that's going to extend your lifespan beyond 20 or 30 years, any sort of medical uh, treatments that might be available in the, the plant life, especially, that exists out there. And uh, they would uh, definitely you know, be very curious and, and start experimenting, I think, to try to find anything that might be uh, fermentable and then perhaps uh, put you know those herbs into the alcoholic solution because alcohol really is an ideal way to dissolve an herb uh, and the various alkaloids and other compounds that are in it. So we can sort of imagine then uh, one of our ancestors uh, espying some very brightly colored fruit because we're also you know very visually oriented. And I guess the other assumption here is. Uh, you know, the, basically the people back then would have had the same sensory organs that we have. So they would have known what they liked. I mean, we can have, you know, sort of cultural differences about whether we like sweet, sour, and so forth. But basically, we're working with the same uh, sensory apparatus. So here we've got, you know, our uh, early human uh, eyeing a, we're looking out at this, but, you know, picking a, a fig. And we can imagine them 
you know, piling, you know, masses of this fruit into some primitive container, perhaps made out of wood or leather, and it will, after a few days, especially in a warm climate, you'll get liquid uh, oozing out of the fruit at the bottom of your container just by the sheer weight, and then uh, naturally fermenting because there is uh, yeast, you know, on the outside of these fruits. So in a few days, you might very well have a Stone Age Beaujolais Nouveau <laughs> or a sour ale. You had to drink it fast because you had no way of preserving it. I mean, they didn't have glass, they didn't have pottery with stoppers and so forth. So, uh, we, we, you know, but once they get down and they start, you know, smelling this and saying, oh, this is, smells very good and, you know, tasting it and getting some mind-altering effect, uh, I think we can expect that they would go back and, you know, to that same place year after year to get whatever they could. So this could go back, you know, very early. Um, and, in fact, you know, when you think about it, uh, Fermentation itself is the basic energy process on Earth. It may be like the earliest form of energy production we have. And if you look through the animal kingdom, almost every creature, uh, you know, from the fruit fly right on up to the elephant, is attracted to sugar and alcohol. Uh, recently, there were these Malaysian tree shrews uh, that represent the sort of the earliest uh, primates uh, 55 million years ago. They, uh, they spend their whole night sipping on a palm nectar wine, and they drink uh, about the equivalent of nine glasses of wine over that time. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's not difficult to imagine then that uh, humans, <laughs> we call this the, the Paleolithic or drunken monkey hypothesis, uh, other uh, primates, you know, uh, further up, uh, would also be attracted to sugar and alcohol. In fact, uh, with chimpanzees, if you give them a chance, you have, a, you have an open bar, so to speak, you know, an experiment where you just open up the bar. Uh, the males, especially, they will put away three to four bottles of a full-size wine, you know, 750 milliliters, in about 20 minutes. So, so it's, uh, it's not something that's uh, unusual. Uh, you know, all animals really, uh, you know, are attracted to, uh, to alcohol and sugar. And I think the way to really drive this point home is to play this uh, movie, a short movie clip of animals eating uh, ripe uh, figs uh, in Africa. And uh, I think this really gets the point across. It's in French. You'll get the idea. co-opted uh, the natural process of fermentation probably very soon on to make fermented beverages. And uh, there's a lot of good reasons uh, besides those I've already mentioned. Uh, alcohol really is the universal medicine. You know, before we had all our synthetic medicines, I mean, alcohol was what relieved pain, uh, stopped infection, and you know, seemingly uh, cured disease. And uh, those people that drank an alcoholic beverage actually 
could live longer and reproduce more because if you drink water, you're taking a chance that there's microorganisms in it, but if you drink an alcoholic beverage, the alcohol is gonna kill a lot of those harmful uh, creatures and, and keep you well. So it, uh, it is a, you know, definitely a way to, uh, to, you know, to stay healthy. And the other thing is our livers actually have about 10% of their enzymes are devoted to changing alcohol into energy. So it's actually a food source. Now then you go beyond that uh, and you, you look at the social lubrication. You know, the fact that when you have people you know, drinking alcoholic beverage, they tend, it breaks down barriers between people. And you know, you really get this sort of esprit de corps uh, developing. It's a, uh, it also you know, leads to sort of a, an exhilaration of being alive. So here you've got these, this group of people, uh, you know, gathered around, uh, you know, maybe discussing the fact they've just taken down a woolly mammoth that day, and you know, ending up the day on a nice, easy note, and uh, all enjoying it. Uh, but the real trump card, I think, when it comes to alcoholic beverage, is this mind-altering effect, uh, because it does unleash a pleasure cascade all these neurotransmitters, dopamine, serotonin, that you know, start cour coursing through our, our brains. And then when you couple that with the actual process of fermentation, which the ancient people wouldn't have understood, but was like a magical thing. I mean, they would, they would see the, uh, the carbon dioxide coming off the, uh, the fermenting beverage, you know, just, you know, oozing up, throwing up, you know, all sorts of gases and so forth, almost like there was a, an external spirit that worked there. They couldn't see the yeast. You know, that's microscopic, I and mean, we had to wait to Pasteur, you know, for that to be discovered, but they could see the results. And this happens to be the most ancient uh, wine vessel that we've yet identified chemically that it was a wine vessel. It's from another site that the uh, museum excavated in Iran, of all places, uh, dated about 5400 BC. And if you carried out the fermentation in that vessel, you could actually expect it to start to rock back and forth. And so it's like there's some sort of a mysterious, you know, force at work. And, and then you can sort of start to see why people would uh, place fermented beverages right at the center of their cultures. And so when we look all around the world, both in the past and the present, uh, there's some sort of fermented beverage, you know, like even uh, Judeo-Christian tradition. I mean, wine is right at the center. But if we look in other places, you see the same thing. Um, so, for instance, in Africa, uh, it is like a, a, a continent awash in fermented beverages. There are millets, sorghum beers, honeymead, uh, banana, and palm wines, and all their activities, you know, from birth to death, you know, including everyday meals, social events, religious festivals, they all sort of center around a fermented beverage. And this is really, uh, uh, you know, very characteristic of the human species uh, to do this. Now, we're gonna have a, a sample tonight uh, from Dock Street Brewery, which is just up the way here on, on Baltimore Ave, of a sorghum uh, beer. And I didn't get a chance to ask Rose uh, Marie if she wanted to say something about this. Uh, are you here? Rose Marie? I'm here. Would you like to, to you know, say something about no, thank it? Thank you. I'm not ready for it. You I can think just we'll discuss it, or, or Ben. Ben might want to say something. I don't know. Uh, you know, you're welcome to, to do that. Uh, you know, maybe just to describe, you know, what went into it. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I think that'd be good. by the traditional sorghum African beverages that you can find all over the continent. Um, so what we did with ours, it's 90% uh, sorghum, basically, and we use a local wildflower honey and a number of uh, native African spices. So we use hibiscus, rose hips, uh, rose flower petals, grapes of paradise. Is there anything else in there? Oh yeah, rooibos, which is a, uh, a South African herb, uh, African red bush tea, if any, any of you might have had it. Um, so uh, it's really, you know, sort of 
similar to what uh, Sam was saying, just sort of an experimental beverage based on something of the ancient past that uh, you know we're sort of trying to introduce to a new public and everything. So you know, we're happy that we're here to be a part of it. So, that. Thanks very much, Ben. Uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, at this point, uh, you know, Pangea, which is another uh, dogfish head brew, really fits in very well because it demonstrates sort of the universality of these fermented beverage cultures, you know, going deep into the past all over the world. And so maybe, uh, Sam, you'd like to say something about Pangea? So, so Pangea is one that we uh, uh, did sep separately from, from our work with Dr. Pat, but uh, as, as he alluded to, it, it kind of uh, weaves into what Ben was saying, what, what Pat was saying earlier. That one, uh, its origins really came in from an, uh, a, a odd place, which was the first time we were bombing, our country was bombing Iraq. I was uh, on vacation with my family. My son was three or four watching that, and it was uh, all the TV was showing, and it was bumming us out. So uh, we put on, I said, put on whatever you want. He put on a di dinosaur movie um, for kids, and it showed uh, before the separation of, of, of the, the one land mass, it, it, it showed uh, that there was just one land mass called uh, Pangea, and while I was uh, there with him, I said, "Wow, wouldn't it uh, be neat if if we could, in liquid form, put a fractured world uh, back together?" And that was, in, as an English major, my naivety. I don't know what idiot decided to make Antarctica a continent, uh, but we decided to make a beer with one ingredient from every continent. And uh, so there were obvious choices on many of those continents, but uh, we were down to pretty much. Uh, you know, penguin, penguin poop and, uh, and uh, iceberg water uh, from Antarctica, and we found a, a military base that actually housed a bunch of home brewers uh, who, through reverse osmosis uh, process, um, uh, produced uh, potable water and actually homebrewed with it. So they would send us up uh, that water. In addition to that, from uh, Australia it has uh, uh, um, crystallized organic ginger, which is probably the most forward uh, flavor component and spicing of Pangea, uh, Madagascar uh, sugar uh, from Africa, uh, and numerous other uh, ingredients from uh, different continents. But what's, uh, while, while this slide is up, I will take a moment to say that uh, pre-Louis Pasteur, pre an understanding of uh, microorganisms and yeast and how they work, the magic, that bubbles that Dr. Pat was talking about, odds are most ancient beverages, whether they were the sorghum-based beer that Dock Street uh, brewed or uh, Midas Touch that we brewed, would probably most closely mirror modern lambics, uh, which are Belgian beers fermented with wild yeast, because these early brewers, in reg regardless of what culture they were from, probably didn't have the same understanding of sanitation on a micro level level that us brewers do today. So there'd be a lot of sour and off flavors. So if there's any sort of modern uh, skew that we are putting on these beers, it's uh, de it, it, it's uh, paying attention to sanitation to the level that modern brewers do to allow the indigenous ingredients to shine through beyond what the wild yeast might have uh, contributed back in there, that era. So that's, that's Pangea. Yeah, I, sh I should say that uh, you know, there are certain parts of the world that uh, humans have not been able to do a fermented beverage, like especially the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, you know, some people say that you can take uh, bear fat and ferment that into an alcoholic beverage, but I don't think so. Or penguin fat. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, so, and then there's also areas where you get like prohibitionist movements, you know, and that could be, uh, you know, like parts of India where you know Hinduism would prohibit uh, alcohol beverages or. They may have had the alcoholic beverages back at the beginning, but then for various uh, religious uh, reasons, uh, they might have turned away from it. The, the same sort of question comes up with the North American Indians. We're not really sure why they uh, don't seem to have any evidence yet of an alcoholic beverage. And uh, you know, some people say, well, tobacco really came in and sort of displaced uh, the alcoholic beverages. But maybe it's just a result of uh, not having the archaeological excavation or surveys that have been done yet to really 
in the chemical studies to really see. Uh, I should also have said something here about you know how these uh, Tariki people in Kenya are drinking their millet beer. Uh, this is, is very typical all over the world to make beer in a, in a vessel like this, and you keep reusing the same vessel over and over again because it has the yeast you know embedded in the, the pottery. But then uh, to really retain a lot of the flavors, uh, you have to have like a long straw or a drinking tube to get down below the, the gunk that's on the surface. You know, you don't, you don't really, you know, you're not going to uh, filter this beer. I mean, you really want to keep it as intense as possible. And the way you can get down to the liquid is to use a long straw like this. And it's often a very social activity where everybody's involved. Um, but now I, I want to turn to the beverage that I, I think, to me, is the most exciting. And this is uh, the one from China that we discovered, uh, I think, about five years ago. It, uh, you might think the Middle East is where everything began. You know, this is the Fertile Crescent. This is uh, you know, where the earliest wine probably came from and so forth. And so when I was invited to go to China for the first time, I think it was uh, 1999, uh, I had this really great opportunity to travel all over the country. In, in the, <coughs> with another archaeologist who really introduced me to everybody. And uh, it turned out that the earliest uh, alcoholic beverage so far, going back to 7,000 BC, is from China. I mean, eventually, you know, the Middle East or some other area may, uh, may come into play here. And it's particularly, uh, it's the site of Jiabu. It's an early Neolithic site, uh, 7,000, 6,000 BC, in the Yellow River Valley, uh, where uh, there's burials and uh, domestic houses and so on that show that they were making a fermented beverage, enjoying it, probably using it in ceremonies uh, as long ago as 9,000 years ago. And these are the types of jars that we analyzed. Now, what's amazing about China, too, is it is, uh, has the earliest pottery, going back to 13,000 BC. The Near East is only 6,000 BC. So, you know, the Near East really is, is far later uh, than what is in China. And look how beautiful these vessels from 7,000 BC really are. I mean, uh, you know, very well contoured. They have these high necks that show that they were used for a liquid. And this is what uh, we would choose uh, as possibly being a beverage container. And pottery, now that it's available, is the ideal material for us to work with because it is virtually indestructible and it has pores in it so a liquid will be absorbed into those pores and be held by the clay structure until we come along thousands of years uh, later and can actually pull out, uh, tease out these ancient molecules and try to identify the ingredients. Now this uh, is a, it's sort of similar to Midas Touch. It has rice uh, instead of barley as the grain. Uh, the fruit actually included uh, grape and hawthorn fruit and then honey, uh, again, to make a kind of beer or wine. Now, uh, if you have a, a grain in there, you know, you can talk about it being a beer. Uh, but if you get that uh, up to a higher percentage of alcohol and it has more aromatic qualities, uh, you can talk, talk about it being a wine, too. So there's like sort of no real you know, fast demarcation there between uh, wine and a beer. And so you, you, you can call, you know, sake, rice wine, uh, rather than rice beer. And then it also has the, the fruit uh, uh, wine and then uh, the honey. Uh, if I had more time tonight, we could talk about, you know, a lot of interesting questions related to this. Uh, one of them is, uh, this is the earliest use of grape in any alcoholic beverage that we know of. And yet it comes from a place, China, where we have no information about there ever being a domestication of its many species. The only species of grape that was ever uh, domesticated and gives us 99% of our wine is the Eurasian grape, the Vitus vinifera. So, you know, how is it the Chinese are already tossing grapes into this beverage? Uh, we could also talk about uh, the rice uh, and how it was changed from a starch into a sugar. Now, this is some of the earliest rice from China. And uh, it could have been malted like barley. Uh, it could also have been chewed. And we think that chewing is really probably the earliest way that humans would have transformed a starch into a sugar.
because in our uh, saliva there is uh, an enzyme, ptyalin, that breaks starch down into sugar. So it's, uh, it, it may not sound you know, very uh, appetizing to think that people uh, you know, are preparing their beverages this way, but once you get an alcoholic beverage, it does kill off any harmful you know, bacteria. And you know, it might add some special flavors, too. You never know. Uh, now, here we've got the, uh, the people, again, gathered around a pot of their uh, brew in a, a modern village in southern China using the long straws. And there are very good examples of how, uh, even today, in Taiwan and some islands out in the Pacific, they, uh, the women, particularly, they will uh, gather around a big bowl and uh, do the chewing of the rice and then spit it out for a marriage ceremony. And this is, you know, let the fermentation take place and that will be presented at the uh, marriage ceremony. And we'll be talking about some other salivating uh, experiments that we've carried out a, a little bit later. Uh, the other thing that Jahu had, which was quite exciting, is it has the earliest playable musical instruments ever found. They're all made um, from the, uh, the bone, uh, to one specific bone of the red crown crane. It does a very unusual mating dance where it gets up, you know, flutters its wings and so forth, and, and lets out a very loud uh, sound, poop. Uh, and this is the excavator of the site actually playing this. These uh, instruments, even though they're 9,000 years ago, they play the same pentatonic scale and traditional Chinese music that we have today. So this really shows how China is like, you know, incredibly long uh, tradition, um, you know, going back. Uh, and, and then finally we come to our, our beverage, uh, Shato Jahu, which is uh, the recreated one. Uh, this is the, the label, which uh, tends to push the envelope a little bit, uh, just like the beverage inside of it. Uh, but there's, a, there's something behind this, and I don't know if Sam may want to describe his, uh, his dream a little bit too. Uh, but this, uh, this, is, uh, this enigmatic tattoo that you see here is actually the sign, the Chinese sign for wine, in which you have three, you have a jar with three drops coming off of this. And this started back in the Shang Dynasty, 1200 BC. <coughs> Excuse me. And it uh, has gone on continuously. So that sign is still used for an alcoholic beverage. So when you travel around China, it's the one sign that I recognize. <laughs> it's always above the shop, you know, so I know exactly where to go. Uh, so uh, maybe, uh, Sam, you want to? Uh... Well, the other thing I should say before you can get is that th what's really excited me about this beverage, besides its uh, flavor profile, the sweet and sour, which we worked on a great deal, uh, is it just got the gold blind tasting award at the Great American Beer Festival. <laughs> and this is the high point of my research career, I think, you know. Uh, you know, when we found out, you know, we went up to the podium, you know, got Sam present Tracy a lot better. Here we go again. <laughs> Houston Street. Plus that one's well good. Deep right center. I think people really want to listen to the ball game right and not press the Chase some awards. Monster home run to center field. And the Phillies are back with a run. that we won the gold medal for the <laughs> or 97 and I brought my dad to that and uh, and we, we had beers like Raison d'Etre made with beet sugars and raisins, Chicory Stout uh, 97 made with licorice root and uh, 
vanilla beans and St. John's wort. We used to say, hey, it's the world's only antidepressant depressant. So you can <laughs> drink as much as you want and level your rate out. But in that era, even at the GABF, everyone just you know, thought we were nuts. And Dr. Pack in the test, we, we, we purposely chose a theme for our booth at the Great American Fest, Beer Fest, which is the biggest beer festival in the world, of ancient ales. And uh, mostly the beers we've done with Dr. Pat, but also our Sati, which references a ninth century uh, Finnish uh, beer and a couple others. But we didn't have any of our five best-selling beers that we make at that booth, and yet the energy and excitement around that booth uh, was uh, really in impressive. And uh, to think that in that first era when we were serving beers like Chicory Stout and Raison d'Etre, and the, we didn't have any categories to enter those beers in because they were just such stringent, again, Ryan Heitzkabel referencing categories that existed for beer in the mid-90s. And so we would enter them and they would laugh them off, our beers, because they had these exotic ingredients. But it's amazing to see how, uh, how much the, the pendulum has shifted in the craft beer and even the general beer world that there are now categories like uh, specialty or exotic or garden beers or uh, honey categories that didn't frankly exist that long ago. Uh, so it shows that the whole beer world is recognizing that our traditions as, as human and brewers uh, much predates uh, the Ryan Heitzkabel. So as, as Dr. Uh, Pat referenced, that, that label was done by a woman named uh, Tara McPherson, who's a pretty famous rock and roll artist. She does all the work for uh, the Melvins, the Shins, My Morning Jacket, great indie bands that I, I love. Uh, so I asked her to do that for her, and Pat was like, eh, it's kind of risky. Uh, so uh, at first he was a little unsure of it. But now he has that exact same tattoo in that exact same place. So. <laughs> He's on board, he's on board, which is nice. Um, uh, but this one for me is, uh, as it, it did win the gold in the specialty beer category. We're, we're one of the few breweries that ever has won uh, two awards in the, in the same category. So uh, this, this one's uh, uh, special for me, but it, it's uh, probably more special for me because it's ground zero for fermented beverages in the history of civilization. And I know there's a lot more uh, scientifically and history-minded people in this room than, than, than me, but uh, this, this, this beverage being about 9,000 uh, years old pretty much coincides with our human ancestors shifting from you know, nomadic uh, tribal uh, you know, hunting and gathering wanderers to uh, uh, a, 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 a being that, that stayed around and, and formed villages and formed societies in essence, the birth of, of civilization as we know it. And there's a pretty strong uh, school of thought that says the reason we sat around and formed these villages was to, to watch our grains grow and to watch our crops grow so that we could make uh, beer, we could make fermented uh, beverages. Uh, and so in essence, as a brewer, it gives me a lot of pride that, uh, you know, as far as I know, our, our, our industry is responsible responsible for civilization as we know it, but <laughs> uh, that, might, that might be argued. And the fact that this one dig site had not only the oldest fermented beverage, but also the oldest musical instrument that, that we know of, tells us that this, is, this was like the original hootenanny that was going down <laughs> that night. People were really having a beautiful party and playing music and, and, and enjoying beer and enjoying each other's company and getting closer to each other. And uh, again, something that uh, I'm really proud to, to be involved with my work. Uh, so uh, this beverage, uh, sake yeast and sake rice, uh, as rice is the primary fermentable source in this beer, relatively uh, dry, uh, not quite as sweet as Midas. The Hawthorne, I'd say modern palate, this area most akin to pomegranate, it has some uh, tartness to it. Uh, um, and, and the honey gives it some complexity as well. So that's uh, Chateau Gian. Did I have a drink? You tell me. Well, you, I don't know if is it X or R or PG. The woman had a lot longer hair and so forth. Uh, as you described it to me, I don't know sure. if you were under some illusion here. Uh, but we won't go into any more details. But, uh, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, this is really, it represents the earliest alcoholic beverage we've discovered so far, so to get a gold medal is fantastic. Uh, 